Welcome to the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame podcast, class of 2018. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Wade Keller. I'm the founder and editor of the Pro Wrestling Torch newsletter, host of the Wade Keller Pro Wrestling Podcasts, and I'm joined as co-host today by Bruce Mitchell, who is the Pro Wrestling Torch senior columnist since 1990, also star of the Bruce Mitchell audio show. Uh, Weren't you inducted into this Hall of Fame? Yes. I think I was here for that. You were. I appreciate what you year was up. that? Uh, I think class of 2014. In what, in what category? Because I know it wasn't wrestling. No, it was not wrestling. It was journalism. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Cool. So uh, we're, we're very pleased to be joined by two esteemed guests, Larry the Axe Henning, a longtime AWA wrestler and a frequenter of this Hall of Fame. So if you're a regular attendee of this, you uh, know Larry well, and we're glad to have him here again this year to join us on the podcast. And Nikita Koloff is our guest on My Left, Your Right. And we're going to be talking to them about their careers, what they're up to, and hopefully tell some good stories and have some laughs. So, uh, uh, Bruce, I'm going to let you ask the first question to Larry. Yeah. Um, Larry, as it happens this week, uh, your grandson is one half of the WWE Tag Team Champions and, and hitting a career peak. Um, just like that. about Joe? Yeah. Curtis Axel. Curtis Axel, yes, sir. Are you wondering how he got his name? I, I would really love for you to explain it to me. That'd be awesome. You don't know. I'd not. No, sir. All right. Curtis is for my son, Kurt, that wrestled. Absolutely. And Axel is for me, Larry the Axe Yes, sir. So we came up with Curtis Axel. Who, who came up with it? Well, uh, I can tell you who approved it. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. <laughs> you know, that Vince, you know, he, uh, uh, WWE is like a big Ferris wheel, you know, and to get it, even to get a seat on it now is tough. Absolutely. He's got uh, his billion dollar business, flies around the world in his jet aircraft, private jet aircraft. He's got a fleet of buses. He's got more money than Trump. He does, yeah. I don't know if Trump is as smart. I, I think if, 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 if you put Trump in, uh, Vince's place, uh, Vince would win because he is a very smart guy. Maybe some people don't like him, but I'm telling you that he I wrestled for, as a matter of fact, I wrestled for his dad. Right, yes sir. In uh, New York. Yeah. And, uh, Madison Square Garden. You know where that is? That's right I, around the, I do. Right around the I corner do. from that girl show. Do, do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, Ollie um, Frazier and all the rest of that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, my wife's here. I forgot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I won't tell if you that. <laughs> but uh, one thing about uh, Vince, as long as we brought it up, or I did. Yes, sir. If he told you something, he did it. When I, he said you're going to make so much money, I made so much money. Right. Yeah, and uh, brought my family there when they were young. Uh, we were staying on the 12th floor and some guy fell out the window on the 14th floor. Hmm. The boys wanted to go down and see him. Well, he was deader in a macro. The people were just walking over him. He said, well, that's how they do it in New York. I was about to say, New York City. Yeah. So, so what was the original question? You said, I don't know. Uh, Talk about your relationship with your grandson. And, 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 yes, and he's doing mentoring. You know, he's been with us 10 years. I know, yeah. He's, yeah, and he's yeah. helped him in Florida, you know, and he, he went to Brad Riggins' camp, he was with Harley's, in Harley's camp. Right. Uh, he went to Vince's camp in Florida, we, he just spent $25 million developing that uh, development camp down there. So, uh, people say wrestling's dead, well, it's, it, it's not in his family, I can tell you that right now. So, so and people know that, so. But if it's interesting today, uh, let's talk about it. Huh? I like to make more people aware of what's going, the hell is going on. Uh, some things I like, some things I don't like. And uh, we'll see as the day goes on, okay? And you got some good looking people here, and then you got some that are on the margin line. <laughs> I, I don't you know, represent them. <laughs> I'm going to wait till the end to point them out. So. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, we want to stay. So, so. Um, uh, Nikita, um, uh, uh, Bruce Mitchell watched your career up close from the front row. He was talking about that earlier on. Talk about. We're going to talk about the Minnesota connection here because we're here in the Midwest. 
Um, but uh, Larry talked a little bit about um, his family and, and how they got in, how his grandson got involved because his family was involved. How did you get involved in professional wrestling? That's a great question. And um, first and foremost, in Larry's introduction, you missed one key element to, to his introduction, one key word, and that, that would be legendary. Yeah. Larry. Yeah. Right? And, uh, I mean that with all sincerity. It's just an honor and a privilege to uh, to share the platform with, with Larry today. And uh, it brings back memories. I'll, I'll get to your question in just a second. It brings back memories because uh, his son Kurt and I played high school football together uh, and then played uh, one year of junior college ball against each other, kind of. By kind of meaning, he was on the sideline for the state championship game with a blown out knee. I was on the other sideline with a cast up to my hip with a, with a broken tibia and fibula. So we kind of waved each other across, across the way. Never got to see any action in the state championship game. But a uh, little bit of trivia there or a little bit of history there between um, uh, Nikita and, and, uh, and the Hennings. Um, so interesting story for me just briefly for some who know my story and maybe many who don't is unlike many of the guys who went through like she was just describing all the different phenomenal camps by the way i mean harley races camp i mean oh my gosh yeah. right? brad ringens and then down in florida i mean phenomenal camps i have no doubt i say that because i never went to a camp i never went to a training center i never went to a training site i got a phone call from a guy by the name of Road Warrior Animal, some of you might remember that name, and um, who, by the way, played for that same junior college team that was supposed to play against Kurt, but uh, that's another side note. But um, I never went to a training camp. I was actually training for a pro football tryout. I rehabilitated my, my fractured legs, uh, fractured not one, but two, one my freshman year, and then one my senior year in college. And I was training for a pro football tryout when Animal uh, made a phone call to me one morning and shared a storyline of, of uh, in the Mid-Atlantic Carolinas, the guys looking for uh, uh, just some, some new life down in, in the Carolinas. And he shared the storyline with me of a nephew for Uncle Ivan Koloff, uh, another legendary wrestler. And um, I said, well, did they understand I have no amateur wrestling background, I have no professional training, like whatsoever. I hadn't hit a ring rope at that point. And he said, yeah, that's what I told him. So he gave me the phone number to this promoter named Jim Crockett, who you probably know somewhat well. A little bit, I guess A little so. bit. And um, I, made a, I had a five-minute phone call with him, sight unseen, you know, no cell phones and no FaceTime back then, right? Um, and made clear his understanding that I had not been in a ring before, said it didn't matter, just be in his office on a certain day with my head shaved. I thought, well, I can do that. I can shave my head. And that said, I showed up the day he said to be there, walked into his office, uh, he uh, asked me to take my shirt off, I thought, well, that's kind of weird, but okay, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> job's a job. <laughs> job job's, a potential job's a job. Job's a job, yes, And they said, wait right here, he walked out, walked back in with two guys, Ivan, Kol or Ivan Koloff, Don Carnotto, World Tag Champions, take a look at your new partner. That's literally what he said. Um, and and we uh, Nikita Koloff was born that day in, in the hallway. You know, I was going to be the nephew of Ivan, and uh, they put me literally right on the interview set for hours. Don't talk, you're right off the boat. You don't speak any English. I thought, shave my head, don't talk, and I get paid. Okay, <laughs> that, that works for me so far. Uh, the last short part of that, because there's way more to the story, but we finished the interviews. He said, be in Raleigh, North Carolina tomorrow night. You're going to wrestle on television having never been in a ring. So we get to the building, actually got there a little late, not my fault, but they show me how to tie up and lock up in the dressing room and uh, share with me uh, how, what, what I'm supposed to do. And the one instruction Ivan gave me was, whatever you do, don't trip on the rope getting in the ring or your career's over. I, th I, I think I can do that. Go, how hard can that be? Little did I know until you go to try and crawl in a ring, you've never done it. 11 seconds later, First win in professional wrestling on television, no training, no background in wrestling, and then there's way more to that story, but that's how I broke in. Trained on the road by Ivan Koloff and Don Cronodal.
Yeah. We did, and uh, kind of on the job training. For those of you who've done on the job training for the next two, three months, uh, Ivan, Don, and I would get to the towns two, three hours early at least, and uh, they get so much of the credit because they uh, they bumped all over the ring, uh, teaching me the mechanics of wrestling. And then Ivan, I'd have a match every night, short <laughs> match every night. Ivan would sit in my corner. I'd sit in their corner for the world tag match that they'd have and I'd observe what they did, Ivan would observe what I did, and then in the car, we would discuss the psychology of wrestling, old school psychology. So the mechanics before the match, psychology on the way home after the match, so, crazy. Awesome. You, you were in the main event of the first Great American Bash in Charlotte, that big show, very early on with Rick Floyd. Yeah. Talk about that experience. Yeah, very early, again, just, crazy part of the career is so so that was June 4th 1984 that I broke into professional wrestling um, within 13 months uh, I had become world tag team champions with Ivan and Don kind of switching the belts out world six-man champions and then 13 months almost to the day I'm wrestling nature Boy Ric, Ric Flair for the world heavyweight title just 13 months into the business and needless to say that was a uh, Pretty, uh, pretty phenomenal memory to think back on and the opportunity that I was given. Very, I feel very very blessed and very honored to have had the opportunity. Outside at the stadium, at the Crocker Stadium, um, I'm trying to think what the crowd was. A very big crowd, and I know living in that area, yeah. how excited people were. And you were something of a phenomenon back then. And you were the, for the Crockets, I think you were the first um, communist Russian trader to get a t-shirt. They sold your t-shirt even when you were a bad guy. They, they did and, and I know you made a fortune off of that by the well, way. Well I, I don't know about a fortune. Crockett made a fortune. Yeah, I think, okay. <laughs> Crockett, Crockett yeah. made a bundle. He took it all to the bank. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah they had they they would they would have been well to have Vince's uh, fort you know on when it come to marketing but uh, but that said on that note um, yeah, there's only one that there's only one T-shirt in that day that outsold me. Take a guess. I know they couldn't. Um, that day, and it would have been Flair. I don't. Uh, Flair. Yeah, Flair. Yeah. Flair's shirt out. He's the only shirt that outsell him. I'll say that. Back completely that. figures, and I would have bought. Yeah, both the shirts. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, um, let's switch over, to Mr. Hennig. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's go ahead. Down. Um. Yeah, so the, uh, Nikita was talking about work wrestling Ric Flair at one point, and Ric Flair was around, were you, were you around Ric Flair early in his career? Do you have any Ric Flair stories? I get a lot of stories about Ric Flair, but I can't tell them here. We promise not to tell anyone. Well, first of all, he's a good-hearted guy, and he has some tragedy in his family, and you know, and, uh, but uh, he was one of those uh, loose cannons, you know. He was always into something, whether it be bad or good. But we forgot to mention, it's not that heavy. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, I have participated now in four Hall of Fames in the state of Minnesota, so, and around the world. That's awesome. So i like to have uh, some applause for that. <laughs> See how easy it is, Nikita? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a good guy, good athlete. He's a good friend of my son. And our whole family, I've got, uh, of course, Joe. And then uh, we have uh, like 28 grandkids. Wow. And 20 Five of them are boys. Wow. I figured that one out. <laughs> and I think one of them might be gay. I'm not sure. <laughs> There's her mother or her grandmother over there. She never said it. We live on a lake and I'm in charge of the barbecue, the gas, and the refrigerator. Oh my and uh, that's what I do on weekends. Bait hooks cuss a lot and then I let him ride the in fact Irene I just bought her uh, something special 
I uh, bought her the two new front tires for our riding lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> Very romantic. <laughs> so there's always something good going on at our house. Um, I understand you had a bar at the lake. What? That you ran a bar at your lake. Yeah, for, you ran a bar? Ran a bar. I had a bar, yes. Yeah. yeah. Too long. Too long. <laughs> um, I was told a story about several you and several others going on the boat and then getting stranded can you tell that story i get stranded so you guys got stranded on a boat and someone maybe pulled you to shore yeah no that uh that might have been one of the japanese wrestlers <laughs> oh okay I was, we, we were told uh, <laughs> no, okay. we uh i had a bar but uh we all got on a bus red bass team uh, a couple of German wrestlers, uh, Nick Bachwinkel, Ray Stevens, and uh, two of them, we went to a town and uh, two of them got married. <laughs> and, and drunk. I would think drunk order? goes with it, yeah. In that order? Yeah. So for, did they get married for the evening or get married? <laughs> well, when you own a bar, people say, uh, I'm in the real estate and auction business and I can tell you, uh, bar business is tough right now. No one can compete. They got to buy two hamburgers for four dollars. How the hell can a restaurant survive? You know, you can't do it. But anyway, uh, I, I, Kyle has been a really a good friend here. And, uh, I met so many nice people, and uh, I, I think that. Uh, to keep an institution like this on its wheels, you got to be working and hustling all the time. And I'm, I'm here, and if I can help, that's what I want to do. Awesome, I think I'll... Thank you, Larry. Yeah. yeah. Good shout out to Kyle. It's always a big highlight for us to come uh, for, of the summer. So you weren't done? Just, uh, well, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Yeah, question. yeah um, talk about your team with the Harley Race. Um, um, your tag team with Harley Race. The, the, Big stars. Are they ready? Anyways, yes, sir. Oh, oh shit, that is going to take me all day to do that. That's <laughs> kind of the idea. So, that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Well, you haven't lived until you... You thought his driving was bad here. We were in Australia, and that's when you drive on the other side of the highway. <laughs> I said, Harley, I've got a family, I've got children. What are you doing trying to kill me? You know, he, uh, he drives 30 miles an hour on a on the blacktop, and when he got on the gravel, he'd drive 130 miles. <laughs> I said, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> but that was just one incident. But I, I can tell you that there was no one as tough and as mean. You know, he had no actually wrestling background, but just a plain, tough kid from Missouri. And I mean, he was tough, and he, he feared nobody. He don't, he, and you don't care who it was or how. And, that, and he's a good friend of mine, and he's still a friend of mine. And we talk frequently, but he was in a nursing home now for a while. And uh, I think he just got out of there, and then he got hurt again. But when, as time goes on, he's going to become more, even more popular, because when they find out yeah, that he should, he should do a book, I see some of these wrestling books are, are so bare, uh, boring that uh, it's unbelievable. <laughs> but some of them are, are really good, but I'm just saying, uh, I cannot say one bad word about a Harley Race ever. I'm your friend now, and you'll be my friend forever. Thank you. Amen. One of the best teams in the 60s. Um, yeah. Talk about in the ring and out of the ring and with um, Terry Allen, Magnum TA. Because it's such an emotional ride for us watching. Yeah, that was a, um, you know, thinking back. In fact, Terry, Terry and I talk all the time. Just talked the other day. Um, he still lives in Charlotte, and as I do, just outside of Charlotte. So uh, we, we've stayed uh, in touch over the years, done some business together over the years, done some autograph signings together over the years of course obviously the the the, the natural there is the the best of seven series yes. um yeah thank you that's so many you know that that's i probably hear that from the fans that uh series of matches you know, more than anything else 
is the best of seven versus Magnum. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's unfortunate that he, that he, of course, had the wreck and, and uh, cause he was being groomed. You know, we were talking about Ric Flair earlier. It was clear that Magnum was being groomed for to be the next, you know, world heavyweight champion and really kind of take the reins from Rick at some point. Uh, and so very tragic, uh, as we, uh, those who know the story of what happened. And so I feel fortunate that I was in a position and offered a position to step in where a void uh, was, was, uh, had happened because of his, his wreck. And uh, having come back, came back from a tour in Japan, and I was in Philadelphia, I remember Philadelphia when, when Jim Crockett and, and Dusty told me what had happened. You know, wrestling's, uh, they say wrestling's a work. I wish they would have told me that like years ago, you know, when I was in the ring. That was, yeah, it was my attempt at humor there, okay, but. <laughs> Larry probably knows this terminology. I, I was, I was uh, sometimes termed the, the crowbar. Somebody probably knows that terminology, but uh, I enjoyed, I enjoyed working. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. You see, I wish I had Larry's sense of humor. Okay, next time I, I, I make an attempt, can you read that? Laugh, laugh. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think Larry missed his calling, actually. He should have been a stand-up comedian as well. Larry should have been. But uh, that said, so, so I feel very fortunate to have, have had the opportunity to, to step into where there was a void. And, and you, know, you mentioned earlier about the first commie Russian you know, selling record numbers of T-shirts. And, right. yeah. and then a commie Russian becoming a baby face, right? Like who would have thunk it, right? Uh, as they say in the South. Um, but, uh, but it was a brilliant idea that I felt that uh, Jimmy and, and Dusty came up with and then given me that opportunity to step into that role, uh, which someone just posted recently, uh, a, a clip of, of that, the turn in Charlotte. Oh, it's, it's Were you there in Charlotte? I was not there, but I could, that's one of those TV memories I can remember going, what? <laughs> yeah. It, it, because I just didn't see, uh, you know. Why would you market a communist as a good guy? And it yeah. Beautiful. Well, and you couldn't. In, in the way it was done, I don't know that you could do it today. You know, obviously with the advent of the internet and all of that. But it was at the time really one of the best kept secrets in wrestling, if that's possible, uh, at the time. Uh, there were there were only a handful that that knew it was happening until the night of. Um, the the moment that you walked into the cage, Dusty's already there fighting the forces of the four horsemen and you walked into the cage and then you paused like you weren't going to help him. I thought that was like the key thing and then you rushed in. I thought yeah. that was like the, the little things. I thought that was so well done. Yeah, and I appreciate it. Intentional, obviously, you know, because I wanted to, you know, when I, when I walked out of the dressing room, uh, out, of, out of the babyface dressing room, you know, the, the place kind of went silent except for the music that was playing. Right. It was incredible memory because, you know, walking the aisle, um, you know, it, it was just building the anticipation of what was going to happen uh, up until the point of stepping over the railings and, and, and pausing for a moment there. Right. Walking up, as you're referring to, and, and stepping uh, into the cage door and pausing again. Right. Yes. Just to build a, a crescendo of, of what was going to happen. And then, yeah, then tearing across the ring into Ro Ole, uh, it just uh, erupted. Yeah, you and you and Dusty is Dusty Rhodes is the superpowers before there were mega powers. Um, Y'all were big box office business for a good while after that. It did. Um, it, it did. Uh, about a year and a half. Essentially, anywhere we went, uh, regardless of the size of the building, it was pretty much a sellout for yeah. for a good year and a half there. And and then to have you you know Magnum, you know, in the the Crockett Cup in Baltimore come out to the ring was right. was incredibly. Uh, emotional for the fans and and then for me i think what turned it so strong was was pro wrestling illustrated bill after doing a, a, a magazine cover with just like a headshot and like like a tear coming down yes you know that cry a tear for magnum ta yeah. and that that just the two hated rivals that had a bond yeah and correct that's a great story and now we're friends to this day how about right. that yeah. <laughs> worked out so anyway um, Larry, I want to... <laughs> Wake up, Larry. <laughs> the, uh, 
Akita talked about the the crowd response and and the, the the response of a crowd and how little subtle body movements and pauses or body language can totally take the crowd on a roller coaster ride. Talk about how you worked off of the crowd in terms of the energy and if you have some memories of special memories of perhaps the biggest crowd response you got for something that you did that you're you're pr that you were kind of proud for the rest of the night about something that you did or something that collectively you did that really got a great response. I should have. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just me. <laughs> we were playing tic-tac-toe over here. I beat him four games in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you the greatest thrill. Vern Gagne and I didn't get along. He was really a uh, yeah. But he was uh, a little different promoter because he was a wrestler and he wanted to be champion for the rest of his life. And I, I didn't like him and I didn't like what he did. I can, and I, was, I still talk about him today. In fact, in fact, I went to his funeral and uh, I stood there in front of the uh, deal and he told me one time in the ring, I gave my knee and cracked three of his ribs and as the air was going out of his lungs, he says, You finally got me, you fat prick. <laughs> <laughs> I said, You got the broken ribs, not me. So I said the same thing at his funeral. I know I shouldn't have done that. My wife should have been out for it. Greg Gagne got mad at me. Jim Brunzel got mad at me. <laughs> Uh, Bob Backlund don't know what the hell happened. Uh, we had a lot of strange wrestlers too, you know. Take a guy like the Destroyer. I saw him at, uh, at the uh, uh, Cauliflower Alley Club. I said, Dick, stand up. I'm going to tell you something right now, Dick Byers. You all know who the Destroyer is. I said, it's over. Yeah. You gotta take that mask off. So. <laughs> I said, you know, but that was the bad part. I said, I went in the toilet, went into one of the stalls, and there he's sitting there with his mask on. I said, the case, you know, when you go to the bathroom, you can take it off. <laughs> but uh, yeah, what was the question? <laughs> Big crowd response. What was what stands out as the biggest crowd response that you remember getting for a match or an angle that you're involved in? Uh, I think one of the best matches I had was probably with Billy Robinson. Billy was a good mechanic. Uh, he came from uh, England, of course. Most of you know that. He's passed on now. Uh, Joe Scarpello, uh, Otto Vance. I went to several times. Uh, I brought Irene with me, and uh, I don't know how this ever happened. I went to get uh, something to drink, and I ended up in a nudist colony. I brought this girl back with me because I didn't think anybody would believe me. <laughs> <laughs> she stands up and pops those things out, and she says, you want photo? <laughs> uh, he says, I'll give you a photo. <laughs> she was a, she was younger then and got mad easier. <laughs> but uh, the question is, uh, matches and it's really hard for me to, to say what was my best match because I never had a bad match. <laughs> yeah, I feed my family. And had a new car, had a nice house, had a beautiful wife. I had much money in the bank. That that was during the old days. <laughs> After you get to a certain point, that doesn't happen as often. But uh, I do have a real estate and an auction company and an appraisal company, and I'm still very active in that. Yet. Thank God I got that. Because when it's over, gentlemen, it's over. I, I've been in the hospital, out of the hospital, had my knees done, uh, had my brain looked at, it. they had a problem there, they couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 
know, I just enjoy wrestling. I enjoy it. Uh, it's an honor for me to be in the Hall of Fame. And to be in four Hall of Fames for me is a, a gift from God. So, uh, did you bring the collection plates with you? <laughs> <laughs> you say yes or no? Didn't, can you rank the Hall of Fame's favorite to least favorite? <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> Nikita, just to connect the uh, the Minnesota connection that you and Larry have a little more, that was at the uh, beginning of your group, but the, um, you got to come to the AWA and wrestle late in the AWA's run a little bit. Uh, any memories of ultimately going full circle and working for Vern and working in front of a Minnesota crowd, mostly in Rochester? Yeah, mostly Rochester because, what, well, what Jim Crockett and, and uh, Ganya were doing at the time was co-promotions. And so a lot of like shows in the Meadowlands and some of the bigger markets, they were kind of bringing talent together uh, for a handful of shows anyway. I, I don't know how, they didn't do that for a long, long time. But, but that opened the door for, for me to, to come. And really I was, in a sense, kind of on loan from Crockett uh, to, uh, to Vern to do some of the TV tapings that you're talking about down in Rochester, you know, wrestle against uh, Zabisco and, and some of the other guys. And uh, so it was a, a fun experience. Although, you know, we came up here as the NWA to Minneapolis as yeah. well. And, and so uh, a number of times. So it was a great experience. You know, a little, you know, I mentioned, uh, you talk about the Minnesota connection. I mentioned um, going to high school with Kurt. Um, some know this, but not only did Kurt and I go to high school together and play football together, but so did Ravishing Rick Rude. We were on the same football team. Barry Darso was on the same football team. Um, John Nord, remember if uh, some of you know Nord, the, the berserker, and was on the same football team. And then two of the guys that were in school at the same time, but not on the same football team, were, were uh, Tom Zink, the Z-Man, and uh, uh, the, probably maybe the lesser known Brady Boone wrestled as Brady Boone down the NWA and did some refereeing etc so there were actually seven of us uh, essentially all in high school at the same time that ended up in professional wrestling and uh, the majority of them some you know I mean really all of them pretty pretty decent uh, careers in, in, in pro wrestling so yeah interesting did, did you get to, did you have the privilege of dealing much with Vern directly and get to know him? I'm sure he had a reputation that preceded him a bit. He, he did, yeah. Uh, you know, listen to Larry tell a couple of stories. Um, you know, uh, kind of a tough negotiator. But, uh, yeah, so he was around. Greg was kind of running things more, uh, but Vern was there. And, uh, and so I uh, didn't have, you know, a tremendous amount of it. Certainly no, not the interaction that, that Larry may have had, but, uh, but nevertheless, still... You know, had to, got some experience around him, and, and so yeah. Yeah. Um, I got one. I, I'm going to be showing pictures. I want to get that in before my wife is, is my certified accountant. <laughs> and uh, I've got a picture of uh, uh, <laughs> Donald Trump, the president of the United States, myself. And who's the other guy in the picture? Bret Hart. Bret Hart. And it's uh, done real nice so it can be framed with the date and everything on it. So when you go by there, uh, I would like for you to see it and then I'd like for you to buy it. <laughs> but take a look at it. How many, how many times are you going to have an opportunity like this? And. Uh, Nikita and I both will sign them, but I'm not giving them a cut of anything. <laughs> <laughs> so you did learn from Vern. <laughs> He's so busy down there shaking hands that the heat's not going to bother him anyway. <laughs> Mr. Hennig, um, you also <laughs> toured Japan, I know, with Luthes. Do you have any memories of, of the differences working in Japan and, and how you were treated and, and, and how, it's, how Japanese wrestling is so strong in that culture? It's a bit of a trip out here. You know, that happens when you get old. There you go. 
Um, talk about working in Japan with Lee Thais. I had it off till that time, so. Uh, <laughs> so tell me, ask me again. Yes, sir. Um, talk about working in Japan with, uh, on tour with Lee Thais. Um, and just your work in Japan, too, because you were an international star. Talk about your work in Japan with Lou Thais. Oh, God, what a great story. <laughs> uh, one of the greatest guys in the business, if you, if you looked at a champion, uh, Vern Gagne, and you, and you looked at Lou Thais, there was no comparison. I'm, I'm not, not knocking Vern, but uh, I have to do it. Uh, if you compare them to black and white, Luz Ez was by far the, the best of them all. Mm -hmm. Gentleman, uh, good technical wrestler, uh, good attitude. Uh, he had everything as far as I was concerned, and uh, God bless him. And him and his wife and Irene and I, she always brings me cookies. Isn't that nice? Yay, cookies! Yay. I got a bigger hand for cookies than I did for Vern Guy. <laughs> Unbelievable. And Donald Trump. Uh, now what are we talking about? <laughs> I'm, 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 uh, I'll be celebrating in another month and a half my 83rd birthday. That is awesome. We've been married 63 years. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, That's incredible. Wow, awesome. You married her when she was 10? Five. Oh, five. <laughs> Did you marry her when she was 10? You know, yeah, she was five. 10. <laughs> she was nine. <laughs> five. five. <laughs> No, but we've been uh, around a long time and we got some beautiful, you cannot believe how good looking our, our kids and grandkids are. And I want to say something about Kurt here too. Yeah. Kurt, uh, we had uh, three boys and two girls. Is that right, Emmy? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she hesitated. But I'm going to tell you something. Uh, whether you people know it or, or, or followed wrestling, Kurt, or you can ask Nikita, he was one of the greatest athletes in the world. He could do anything. I'll tell you a story about him and Wade Boggs, who's in the Hall Baseball Hall of Fame. They were doing those uh, vignettes, you know, those things, you know hit the ball, play golf, do the, you know, basketball, you know, all that stuff. So they go to the ball field at Yankee Stadium. And uh, uh, he was along. Uh, so he says, Kurt, I'll tell you what I'll do. He says, they'll throw me the ball, I'll hit it, and then we'll catch a picture of you swinging the bat, and then you look over like you just hit a home run, okay? Kurt says, I don't, you don't have to do that. Knock three of them out of the park. <laughs> wow. That's and awesome. he says, where the hell did you come from? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's how natural uh, he was. He hit a golf ball before 300 uh, yards were even talking about it. I mean, uh, can't say enough. And, and all my, my grandkids are doing good. They're good wrestlers. Uh, girls are good volleyball players, a uh, couple of them. Uh, so we've been blessed, really blessed. Did Joe Curtis Axel always have his eye on being a professional wrestler and following in his dad's footsteps? I, I, don't, I don't really think so. I think that uh, uh, towards uh, when Kurt got uh, a little older and stuff, he started thinking about it. And then he, he started going to Brad Riggins' camp. And you, you people know Brad, who Brad Riggins is? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He's the toughest little shit you ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, I'm okay. Ask Nikita, he'll tell you. You know, if you go in there at five foot four, you come out at six foot four. <laughs> stretch you right out like <laughs> But, uh, yes. That's uh, awesome. Uh, we've, been, we've been blessed. Uh, I got a car now that uh, I get 40 miles a gallon. 
thought you might be interested in that. <laughs> She won't let me drive anymore. I'll take it some. <laughs> drive a million, a million miles in my career, and she says, I better drive. So you know, after 63 years, you can, what are you going to tell them? <laughs> I'm going to say no. no. Oh, that's good. But I want to say something about Nikita, too. And Nikita trained hard, worked hard. And uh, uh, we were at a time when, uh, you, you know, you had to do it. You had to. You gotta pay the price. There's no shortcut. Shortcut and people don't make it. And that's in any business. You gotta work hard and do what you do and do the best you can. And I was fortunate that uh, my trouble was that I didn't like promoters, and that's a bad thing to do if you're a <laughs> <laughs> yeah, But anyway. Ask, ask me something funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, think about that. <laughs> Just think about it for a second. All right, promoters. Um, what was the, the biggest crook you ever um, worked for? Who was the who was the biggest crook you ever worked for? The most dishonest promoter. Besides her. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, Stu Hart wasn't a big spender. <laughs> uh, some people they're 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 not crooks, but they don't want to they don't want to separate with their money. <laughs> they pour the milk in the top, and the cream comes out on one side, and the skim milk comes out on the other side. Guess what side the rest of us got? <laughs> so, this is, I'm talking about the old days. No, I'm, not, uh, yeah. I'm not talking about Vince yeah. McMahon or any of them. They were, they always were fair to me. Yeah. But the uh, biggest crook, uh, I, th I think there's a little larceny in them all. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they want to make things go. And so, uh, the only thing a guy can say anything bad about is Vern. And uh, I, I, I'm not going to talk about him anymore because I don't give a shit. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. So, um, same question: um, dealing with promoters, either honest or not so honest. Yeah, no, that's uh, I can I can relate to it, especially the old school uh, format of wrestling because you know. Again, prior to technology and all of that, right? They sell tickets at the 7-Eleven, and and so it's much easier when it, in terms of uh, when it comes to counting tickets to fudge. Yeah, counting the, the seats. Well, early on, I was told I learned two nicknames uh, and, uh, uh, on the what I would say the dishonest side. One his name was High Pockets Henry. That was his, the promoter's nickname. Uh, and then there were two brothers that were known as Frank and Jesse James. Uh, first which, one in South Carolina. Which ironically, I, uh, I just passed through Northfield, uh, the, the great bank robbery. Uh, I, I love history. So anyway, yes, ironically. But on a more positive note, okay, uh, I'll mention, I will mention two actual names that for me were, the, I felt like in terms of delivering the best payoffs and, and uh, outside of Jim Crockett, who took good care of me um, was uh, Don Owens up in up in Oregon, uh, up in the, the oh, Northwest. Yeah. Um, was really took uh, I felt good care, and another guy out of Baltimore named Gary Juster. Um, in fact, Gary was so honest. I told him if I told him once, I told him several times. I go, dude, you're like you, you don't you're in the wrong business. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you you're you're too good a guy to be in this business but uh, you know he's still in the business i i, I just recently understood that heard, yeah. heard that and understood that but works a ring of honor yeah yes. it's it, it's amazing but uh gary took such really good care i felt so gary juster don owens as far as i was concerned I'll, you know behind jim crockett uh, two of the best that, that took good care of me anyway your time in the coal loss you had you had the heat can you talk about any wild experiences, maybe um, atmosphere, people really mad in the ring or? Yeah, you know, a couple something. quick stories. I mean, we had, again, Cold War era, right? You know, the, you know, the dirty Russian from, you know, 
uh, and and the, initially the character, you know, choking people with chains, hanging people with chains. I mean, you know, beating them up after the one, two, three, after the bell, you know, and just to to build the the heat that you're referring to. And, and so there were there were more than one occasion that the the office would got phone calls in those days, death death threats, you know, for the coal office to show up, and of course, you know. Crockett was like, oh, we'll just beef up security, you'll be fine. You know, and I didn't really think much of it, but I had a half a dozen matches, uh, you know, where the fans actually got in the ring. In fact, you made reference to one of them. Great American Bash. Yeah, Great American Bash. That, yeah, that yeah. wasn't part of the act. Yeah. Well, yeah. That was, uh, in fact, it was interesting, because uh, I remember that night, and, and you know, the numbers kind of varied, but the number was anywhere from 25 to 35,000 in attendance, wow. you know, depending on who you talk to. Yeah. This, by the way, you can find a clip of this in, in the, on the WWE Network or what he's talking about um, or on YouTube, and you can see the fan do what he's talking about. Yeah, it was the very hard. first time ever that, yeah. that it had happened, you know, and, and Rick's down selling the ring. I've been standing down on, on the, the, the floor I see David Crockett, who's the special referee, in the corner of my eye, and I'm and I'm in a somebody's got me in a waist lock, and I'm like, I don't remember this part, you know. <laughs> Process of elimination. You see yeah. everybody else. I'm is. thinking to myself, and then, and then it basically dawned on me. I'm like, I think this is a fan, right? And so then I started it, as I go to try to grab him one way, this this little cat would like duck one way, they duck the other way, and and then finally the cops like the. They look like the Keystone cops come in and finally figure out. I don't think this guy's part of the deal. <laughs> right. Maybe we should get him out of here. Yeah. And so he, they they did. And uh, but that was one of about a half a dozen matches that that I had. Uh, Magnum T A was the other one. Uh, we were actually in his near his hometown, Norfolk, Virginia, Norfolk Scope Coliseum, when uh, a, a military guy came came in after me. I know my time watching you guys um, and going to all the shows, we always used to just be amazed that no one jumped in on like the bulkies. They would jump in on big bastards like you and you're like, what are you thinking about exactly? <laughs> it's like, how do you think this is going to go? And it well, never went well for them. I, I, I think they were under the influence of bottles of a couple bottles of courage, I'm thinking, might along be. the way in there. It might be. But perhaps. Yes, yeah, sir. Um, I also want to ask you, you, have a, you had a reality TV show, um, Preacher's Daughter? I did. Well, yeah. my daughter had a reality. I was just a cameo you were up, appearance. No, you were a cameo. <laughs> no, you were a major part of that. Well, it was centered around her, though. Right. Uh, and you can still, I think, go on Netflix and, and, and catch it. But it's centered around my youngest daughter, Colby. Um, and kind of the daughter of... What's it like to be the daughter of a preacher? So, you know, since I left wrestling in 1993, gave my life to Christ, I became a minister and an evangelist, and I travel all over the world, been to 28 different countries now, and, and 1,500 churches, and I'll speak locally here uh, Sunday night at, uh, uh, I should know it, but. Uh, Just say First Baptist, and that'll cover a lot. I hear you. It's not, but uh, anyway, I'll be speaking here Sunday night uh, locally at six o'clock. But um, uh, and so the show just centered around her her life and what that life was like, and the idea of it initially, originally the first season was uh, to understand that hey, even though you're the daughter of a preacher, you know you're still under the you know you still have the same challenges as anyone else, and and et cetera. And so. Um, she did that for two years. The whole family was involved in it, all, all, all of the daughters, and, and uh, yeah, everyone was involved in it. And it parlayed her into a, a wonderful music career and speaking career now in Nashville, Tennessee. So it's pretty cool. Larry, Nikita was just talking about fans running into the ring sometimes when they were not supposed to. Do you have some stories of fending off fans who maybe had a couple bottles of courage in them? My surprise, yes, I do have a couple of stories. <laughs> uh, we were um, West Palm Beach, Harley and I were in a tag team match, and uh, we're sitting uh, in the hall, they played hockey in this <coughs> arena, and we were in the hallway there watching another match, and all of a sudden, uh, he, uh, I think uh, Harley then was wrestling Pedro Morales. Uh, you get you kind of get the picture about uh, the Cubans and Puerto Ricans and Mexicans, and it was full of. And uh, the match got out of hand, and 
Harley was the first one to hit the ring. The fans were coming in the ring. And I was standing there and I had my towel and there was a, uh, uh, from the hockey game, they left a puck laying on the floor there. I put the puck inside the towel and I hit the ring. And I hit this one fat Mexican in the head with the towel, with the, with the puck in the ring, I in the towel. Is that right? <laughs> and the thing came back and hit me in the nose. <laughs> I knocked myself out and Harley says, I think I'm going to get to this boy myself. <laughs> I got up, I was so mad, I hit the son of a bitch again and I hit myself twice. <laughs> and that's it, Harley, I'm out of here. <laughs> there, there's a story for you. My nose all swelled up like this here. Oh. So what happens? You, guys say, you don't want to know. But I'll tell you about a payoff one time. I wrestled, uh, uh, Hardy and I wrestled the Bruiser and Crusher in the Ample Theater in Chicago. It was sold out. <clears throat> and uh, uh, went back, we got our money and a thousand dollars. And two nights later, I wrestled in Winnipeg. And Ganya side hinged me and broke my left knee. Harley, I drove back from Winnipeg with that knee tore out. It took me to the hospital. And that was like uh, on a Wednesday or Thursday. And uh, I was in a room with another guy there and then uh, they had a rematch going in Chicago with the Bruiser and the Crusher. Wally Carwell and Vern Gagne came to my room and said, Larry, you got to go to Chicago. And I was due for the surgery the next day. So I said, okay, I'll go. And I went. The guy in the bed next to me says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Chicago to wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be kidding. He said, no. Anyway, we used a wheelchair and crutches. I got there, made it up to the ring. I, I never got in the ring, but I got on the ring, did some damage out there. And the house, they raised the prices and the house was even bigger than the, it was the time before. And I said, well, I guess this has got to be a good payoff. Gave me $50 more than he gave me the worst match. <laughs> and I got mad as hell and I went to the wrestling office and I made, made some kindling wood out of some stuff in there. <laughs> And uh, they gave me a check with a zero on it. They told me what I'm going to get, and they gave me a zero. So that that was kind of a get a guy out of the hospital, and he cared about the business. Yeah. Got on an airplane, went to Chicago, went from their locker room <laughs> to the ring, and then they give you fifty dollars more. And so that, I wasn't very really happy about that. Yeah. I understand that. Um, I, I get, I get that. I mean, seriously, uh, it's it, those are things that sometimes the, the fans probably wouldn't know or don't know, and uh, and, I, and I'm I'm certain, Larry. I I got good at count, <coughs> kind of counting the, the those because in those days, guys, we and essentially they had their formulas or whatever. However, they figured that out. We were paid by who was in the seat, not on some guaranteed contract. So the more people in the building, the more people in the seat, it's supposed to be the bigger the payoff, especially where you were on the card. And, and so like Larry's talking about, there'd be times the promoter bring the, nu the number in, and I'm like, you're kidding me. Like I'd be main event against Ric Flair or something. And, and you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not a mathematician, but I can count well enough to know that it, the, the number they gave was about half of the crowd size. You follow what I'm saying there, and that was, wasn't everyone, but uh, it was certainly some of them. So you can ask a question. Yeah, um, 
Mr. Hennig talked about uh, the destroyer Dick Byer in, in Japan and wherever he went and to this day protecting um, his business, protecting his gimmick, wearing the mask to the point of absurdity maybe in some people's eyes. But um, I, And I know that Ivan Koloff was in character. If he was ordering at Burger King, he was ordering, not in Russian, but he sounded like Ivan Koloff, and you were a real stickler for that. Talk about how you felt about, and I think you even learned, I mean, I, know, I don't know what it means, but Jatoata, I know for that. Jatoata. Jatoata is the only Russian. And yet. Well, many are still in Russia. Yet. 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 You speak no Russian. No, right. Yeah, no, no, yeah. Me either. Yeah. <laughs> Sounded like it, don't it? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, oh, he really, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, again, being being trained up by Ivan and Don, and then, of course, some of the other, uh, Dusty Rhodes, some of the other guys that I was fortunate to be in the ring with, Ricky, Ricky Steamboat and others, you know, I, I developed an old school mentality. And, and so, uh, I, I didn't, Obviously, I haven't carried it to the degree that you know that that, that Dick has. However, uh, you know, I developed the accent over a number of, of months. I listened to Russian tapes. I learned a few, put a few phrases together. Um, learned to sign my name in Russian. Came to Minneapolis and legally changed my name to Nikita Koloff. And then the accent that I developed, like Ivan. I talked with that accent for, for anywhere anywhere outside of the uh, car we drove in or the place I lived in and even some of the dressing rooms, um, you know, I would talk with that accent any, anywhere and everywhere, 24-7. Um, and, and even like up to after I left the wrestling business, walked, walked away. Uh, for about three years after I left, you know, just protecting the character, protecting the gimmick, before I just eventually phased it out and, and had some good English tutoring and talk like I do now, you know. But, um, and, and so, yeah, it was important to me to protect the character, to protect the, the business, uh, protect, uh, you know, and protect that, uh, that, that persona that I was developing and uh, it was super important to me. Yeah. I think that natural reaction in situations much better than the micromanaged things we see today many times. So. Uh, Larry, uh, Nikita just talked about working on his Russian accent to seem authentic. How often did you work on your Minnesota accent to seem authentic? <laughs> That's the dumbest question. <laughs> I had to figure it out how you got this job. <laughs> He's been asking me dumb questions for 14 years. <laughs> I was just, I was a state, I was out for football when I was a sophomore, and this, the uh, wrestling coach, John Gergato, who is a good friend of He's 90 now. Uh, we're still good friends. And. I got a letter as a sophomore. I beat the uh, right tackle out for mid uh, uh, all conference. And my s senior year, after wrestling, uh, I went out for basketball. And uh, John Gergelko came over and he said, Larry, he said, I want you to wrestle. And he made a man out of me. He made it, made me tough. And uh, first year, never. I took th my sophomore year. I took third in the state. First time I ever wrestled, and then I was state champion. That's how my career started. And uh, if it wouldn't be for John Gregorko, I wouldn't be here today. And, uh, what was the rest of the question? I, I'm curious if uh, did he coach Kurt as well in high, in high school? Greg Alco was he? Yeah, Kurt had the same coach. Kurt, yeah, Kurt started with him, and so did Randy, my oldest boy. Okay. And then uh, he finished. Kurt, we moved. Uh, had a place in Arizona, so he finished uh, football and uh, wrestling in Arizona. And then first he came back and played over here. Yeah. You know. 
And it's interesting you, you you just jogged a, a memory. Grigalko, I, I, when you said that name, I'm like the high school, the high school wrestling coach at Robbinsdale because he he wanted me to go out for wrestling and my. My concept at the time, you know, I thought, give me a helmet and shoulder pads, let me knock somebody's head off, you know. And, and I thought, because I thought, this is just my thinking, you know, the idea of two, like, sweaty guys grabbing each other in their little leotards, you know, didn't appeal to me, you know. That, just my mindset, right? And, and, uh, and Coach Grigelko wasn't very appreciative of my willingness to not go out for the wrestling team. Uh, and he was a PE teacher as well. Get quite a record, you know. Yeah. Oh no, he was he was phenomenal. He was phenomenal. I just didn't have any interest in it, but I remember I was not his class favorite after I telling him no. So. Well, uh, I'm kind of glad I did because in basketball I kept hitting my head on the rim, <laughs> <laughs> so I had to back off of that. That's uh, awesome. <laughs> that was a great memory, Pete Gergelko. You two guys do this for a living. What do you do this every day? Every day, <laughs> day in, day out, every day. Well, That's God bless you for that. <laughs> God bless you, gotta make a living. <laughs> All right, we are uh, at our one hour mark here, so I want to thank Nikita Koloff, Hall of Fame, four time Hall of Famer. That's what, when people have four fingers. Not four horsemen, four Larry time Hall of Famer. Hall of Fame, Larry Dax Henning, a legend. And uh, we're so pleased that they spent an hour with us. I hope you are too. Thank you for coming and supporting this Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame weekend in Waterloo, Iowa. Keep spreading the word and let's give a uh, thanks to Bruce Mitchell for most of what he said, except for me things about me. Richard with the uh, President of the United States and, and autograph and uh, uh, See the cold walls back together. Give us some plugs. Let's, let's sell some pictures, okay? Oh, Donald oh, Trump. Yeah, Donald Trump. Yes. <laughs> you know, come on. Let's show some, some support for Larry here later on with those photos. He didn't tell us who the funny looking people are. He said he's going to tell us at the end. Oh, yeah. Do, do you want to pick out who the funny looking people are in the crowd? Someone wants to know if he qualifies. You can just stand up and he'll tell you. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something right now. I'm really handicapped. Uh, uh, what did you want to know again? Is <laughs> it funny looking you, people in the crowd? Are. At the beginning, you said there's some nice. It's a nice looking crowd and some funny people, and you would say so at the end of the show. Who the ones were that were funny looking? Stumped. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I think that you are uh, people like you and myself are wrestling fans now, wrestling fans then, and you always be wrestling fans. So for me, you were the people that uh, got me to 28 grandkids. Uh, you spend your hard working money, go to the matches, and, and are loyal, and uh, you live for wrestling like I live, only in a different way. So I want to say this, God bless you all, and, and, and I know uh, God will. I've got a, a direct line with him, and uh, he told me the other day that I'm still in the loop. <laughs> so I want to include you guys in the loop also. But thank you and God bless you all. Thank you. Wait, wait and, uh, Bruce, I just want to just ditto what, what, what Larry said. I mean, you know, I, I feel the same sentiments that uh, I think you guys are the greatest on the planet uh, and certainly the most loyal fans uh, anywhere on the planet. And so thank you, I just want to say thank you. Thank you guys for the opportunity to interview. Thank you guys for coming out and letting us share some of our, some of our life with you. Thank you guys. That is a wrap. That's a wrap. Thanks everybody. You're allowed to leave now.